Good morning, hello, and welcome to our audience members joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's program titled What to Make of the Iranian-Saudi Rapprochement and China's Role in It. Um, looking, of course, at the recently announced agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia to reestablish diplomatic ties, uh, the role that China played to make it happen, and what, what we can expect next in Saudi-Iranian relations. We have a stellar lineup with us today. I'll introduce our speakers very briefly here and share a link to their full bios in the chat. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Dr. Yulia Gurul, a political scientist at the University of Freiburg. Her research focuses on Chinese foreign and security policy and China Gulf relations. Uh, she is the author of the EU uh, China Security Paradox, which was published in 2022. I'm delighted to also welcome Dr. Hisham Al Ghannam, a Saudi political scientist and geopolitical expert. Uh, previously, he was a senior research fellow at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies and a senior advisor and, progr uh, and program director of the International Studies Program at the Gulf Research Center. Uh, last but not least, I'm happy to welcome back our good friend Adnanta Batabai, the CEO of CARPO. Uh, as an Iran, Iran analyst, he is consulted by European policymakers and businesses on Iran-related affairs. And through his work at CARPO, he has designed and facilitated Track 2 and civil society dialogues between Iran and Saudi Arabia since 2015. He is also involved in a variety of projects at CARPO on regional security in the Gulf. Uh, moderating the session today is Ambassador William Roebuck, the Executive Vice President of AGSIW. He most recently served as a Deputy Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS and a Senior Advisor to the Special Representative for Syria Engagement. Previously, he served as the U.S. Ambassador to Bahrain from 2015 to 2017. Uh, and with that, Bill, over to you. Thank you, Raymond. Welcome to everyone in all different time zones and locales. Greetings from the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington and Ramadan Kareem. I'm delighted to be with this distinguished panel of experts today, and I look forward to an interesting discussion. Raymond teed it up nicely. We're going to explore the significance of the March 10 agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran to restore diplomatic relations, a deal brokered, of course, by China and announced in Beijing. The two sides have agreed to diplomatic relations and to reopen their embassies within two months. The three-party statement that they agreed to also mentioned respect for principles of sovereignty and non-interference in international affairs. From a U.S. perspective, the White House and Secretary of State Blinken welcomed the agreement and underscored its potential for reducing tensions in the region. In terms of uh, recent developments since the agreement, there have been several foreign minister phone calls reported out. There's agreement uh, for the foreign ministers to meet before the end of Ramadan. Um, National Security Advisor Shamkani visited the United Arab Emirates in a related uh, development. And there are reports that President Raisi of Iran received a written invitation from King Salman of Saudi Arabia. So a lot uh, going on. We want to unpack all those details, examine the significance of, of this agreement, the timing, setting, the two sides' expectations, the role of China, of course, the U.S. reaction, and a number of other angles. So let's jump in and get started. Um, Hisham, I wonder if I could ask you to kick things off. This is the first time these two countries, this is, I'm sorry, not the first time these two countries have established diplomatic relations. Uh, on and off, going back uh, many, many decades, uh, there have been diplomatic relations and some breaks in diplomatic relations. Uh, for example, there was one in the late 80s uh, that went through the early 90s. And of course, the current one uh, that began, the break began in 2016. In those previous uh, periods when there were diplomatic relations, um, it wasn't a perfect relationship. There were crises, there were accusations, there were tensions. Um, so it was uh, a mixed record. I just want to ask you, uh, Hisham, where are we now? How do you view the significance and the scope of the current agreement? Okay. Um, I'm very glad to be here, Ambassador. Um, it's the last fast, fasting hour of Ramadan uh, day, but uh, contributing to such an important discussion with my distinguished colleagues at these changing critical times, I think is very necessary. 
I must confess that uh, what happened until now have exceeded the expectations of many. Uh, the pace, the momentum, the presentation of the deal, even for people like me who said more than a year ago on, on record that multiple signals coming from the region and from both sides tell us that we should witness some sort of a, a normalization between the Saudis and Iranians, regardless of what happens in Vienna. As a result, in my opinion, and that's why, I mean, that's what makes this time different, I think, and I'll come to this later, but there is a clearly a growing uh, uh, regional agency and the, and, and, and the dialogue with the Iranians was an internal Saudi decision to, uh, to engage in a serious and sincere discussion. Um, at that time, I remember, I still remember that the overwhelming majority of analysts, experts and pundits claimed that this will never happen without a nuclear deal, an international settlement with Iran. And now we have what seems as a, a regional grand deal in the making, I would say. Um, even though the agreement, or at least what we know of it until now, comes with no comprehensive plan to solve the main contentious issues between the two states. But I truly believe, uh, and for many good reasons, that it should and could pave the way um, to um, first better coordination between the two and much more stable region. Not necessarily a unified security framework, but a functioning Yemen, a functioning Iraq, and a functioning Syria. Well, this would be something beneficial for, for the two countries and, um, and a win-win situation and for the region as a whole. I think from a Saudi perspective, um, the deal was, um, uh, to say the least, um, a diplomatic breakthrough. It opens the door for, uh, uh, for multiple economic uh, opportunities, which is um, the real strength of the kingdom, the comparative advantage that it has. No other state in the region um, can compete with the Saudis and, and, and this uh, path. Unlike security interventions, which is very costly in multiple levels uh, for the Saudis, also winning the economic battle, I think, should come with influence, a sustainable and positive influence. Uh, winning hearts and minds, much needed now in the miseries all over the region. Another important observation, I would say, is the way that the Saudis um, look at their problems with Iran. Uh, for Riyadh, I think it's the Iranian interventions in Yemen and Iraq, among many other places. In addition to um, Iran's uh, drones and advanced missile programs, these Saudis, these Saudi concerns are not part of the nuclear talks, which makes them very different from what America or Europe wants from Iran. Honestly, I find it very strange um, when someone claims that the demands from Iran are identical and the Gulf for the Saudis should be satisfied by the current international demands from Iran. Uh, this was the, actually, this was the root of the main problem uh, since 2015. Yeah, different demands will also explain why did the Saudis have this agreement before, let's say, concluding an American plus European deal with Iran. Uh, having said all this, the Saudis are not naive in the sense that uh, they know that Iran won't restrict its missile program for anyone. But Riyadh believes that a sincere normalization, a serious and honest reach out, at least from the Saudi side, with Iran can contribute to stability in places that concerns Riyadh most, yani, such as Yemen and also Iraq. I will add Iraq to the list. The Saudis also claim, for several also good reasons, that they want to lead and be the voice of the global South, as they call it, or the developing nations. So starting with the immediate neighborhood, and it makes totally perfect sense. Another important point, if you allow me, that had, I think, set the stage for all these changes, the Saudis have a very clear roadmap in the next seven years. The Saudi main driver of its foreign policy is its social and economic transformation. This is priority number one. And so success will not be uh, possible at all uh, without stability, um, a minimum level of stability, which can only be achieved by having normal or working relationships with Iran and maybe other problematic states in the region. We saw what happened recently with Syria, the, the decision to reopen the, the consulates. Um, the Chinese say it's good to know what's uh, uh, bad first to be able to fix it. And I think that in the last uh, two de decades, the Saudis, since the invasion of Iraq, uh, the Saudis and other US partners in the region realized through, um, although gradually, that over-dependence on a foreign power, even if it was America, 
We made them at best a function of others, a disposable tool in the US grant plan if it exists. I think that uh, this reality is the overarching uh, theme to the to first the very active Saudi diplomatic efforts and overdrive uh, and diplomacy and extends to the changes that we are witnessing in the whole region. I can come to these uh, issues in details later. Thank you, thank you, Hisham. That's a great uh, introduction for us as we dig into these issues. Um, i not. I have a, a similar question. Um, for you, if you would, um, from your perspective, assess the dimensions of this diplomatic achievement. Um, is it a moment, as Hisham mentioned, of uh, special uh, regional agency? Um, what's the uh, scope of the achievement? Is it a return to status quo, uh, or is it something beyond that? Thank you, big time. I'm uh, delighted to be with all of you today to discuss this. Um, no, I think uh, Dr. Hisham is right by saying that this has the potential of moving towards something like a grand bargain, as he as he put it. We are all aware of the stumbling blocks until that can be achieved. We are all aware that this is all a very nascent process. But at the same time, we should not um, downplay the whole process because it's nothing that was just um, born out of nothing. Let's really um, think of the past two, three years, um, and even one could say beyond that, but the earliest that I would start for the for the sake of this discussion today is the year 2019, when we actually saw a level of regional um, escalation in the Strait of Hormuz in particular, with uh, attacks on tankers, oil, um, oil installations, etc. cetera. Um, Iran shut down a US drone over Iranian airspace, Early 2020, uh, Qasem Soleimani was assassinated, Abu Mahdi al mohandes alongside him in Baghdad. Um, the pandemic kicked in right afterwards. So after a geopolitical escalation of tensions in 2019, the pandemic hit the region, which led to an overall pause in some of the regional approaches and postures of regional actors. Um, and in order to, um, to focus a bit more on the Iranian rationale behind this and what we saw now in, in March with the declaration in Beijing, to me, what matters and makes the whole thing more solid than one would first assume is um, Iran's JCPOA experience and the, the notion or the disillusionment over what the lifting of sanctions can do, the magic that was once believed to be in um, the lifting of sanctions um, has really led to a rethinking of how Iran's economy can be made more resilient and more resistant to external pressures. And this rather utopian notion of neutralizing sanctions or shielding the country's economy from the effect of sanctions is something that the Iranian uh, state is pursuing both domestically and in terms of its foreign and regional policies. With the 15 countries bordering Iran, exploring trade avenues with these immediate neighbors is something that the, the Iranian strategists have been working on since 2019. And obviously, Saudi Arabia is a major player um, in Iran's immediate neighborhood. So apart from security calculations about stability in the region, which um, pretty much along the lines of what Hasham has put out matters to Iran as well, I really see uh, a very um, accentuated uh, economic dimension to Iran's approach to this. Um, we have seen that the talks in, held in Baghdad between Iran and Saudi Arabia that started in April 2021 were in fact um, in the making almost a year before that. Um, so there has been a lot of um, efforts in making sure that there is a back channel that functions and importantly, it was the security and military apparatuses of both countries that started this um, dialogue channel. Um, what we do not have to be worried this time is that diplomats um, bring something forward, some sort of a olive branch, and then the guys in the deep state or the security apparatuses basically undermine this. This is now exactly the other way around. We are now seeing um, uh, the F Saudi Foreign Minister Prince Faisal and his Iranian counterpart on the phone uh, multiple times within 10 days. You mentioned that already, uh, dear Bill. 
Um, now the diplomats are taking over and translating what the security apparatuses have worked out so far into policy, into a diplomatic effort. And um, also to, do, to, to keep the focus on Iran, this whole file was basically led not by the foreign ministry, not by the president's office, but by the Supreme National Security Council, the one entity of the Islamic Republic, which in fact embodies not only factional, but also institutional consensus when it comes to securities decision making. So when the secretary of the Supreme National Security Council, Ali Shamhani, leads these negotiations or meets um, uh, his counterpart in Beijing, then that means that this is a systemic consent, that there is a systemic consensus behind it. So that that makes the whole thing more solid. Um, final point would be what I find promising is that in the statement issued on March 10th, there is a clear reference point to previous accomplishments between the diplomatic and security apparatuses of these two countries. So this is not a one-off out in the blue um, moment, but there is some points of reference here uh, that I believe can be built on. The most important point will now be quick follow-ups. The roadmap that is outlined towards re uh, re-establishing diplomatic relations will have to better work soon because we all know that there are saboteurs that we will probably also discuss um, uh, in the upcoming minutes uh, of this webinar. Thanks, and back, and back to you. Thank you, Adnan. Um, Julia, a question for you. Um, Adnan mentioned the important economic dimensions of this uh, development. Of course, China has played a, a key role in mediating the agreement. Uh, in your view, does this give the agreement more significance or does it increase its chances for uh, success? And give your sense, if you would, of the importance of the agreement and China's involvement and of this economic dimension uh, <clears throat> brief that uh, Adnan mentioned. We can go into it a little more in detail later. Yeah, thank you so much, Ambassador, and a uh, very, very good first question. Um, to understand the significance that China's involvement has actually played for, for this agreement coming to life, uh, I think we can mention three major points. The first is the significance of China doing that does not necessarily come from what China did, but from what the US did not do. Um, so I think at that point in time, China was the only extra regional actor who could have facilitated uh, this, this agreement. Um, so, so brokering this agreement and, and taking this moment, uh, this momentum, was a major symbolic and diplomatic win for China. It was also a geopolitical move uh, that, that in inherently undercuts the US influence uh, in the Middle East. And the second point is that China did that shows a paradigm shift on behalf of China, moving away from its longstanding policy of not becoming involved, of being an apolitical actor, mainly economic uh, oriented regional footprint, um, towards becoming a more proactive political and, and diplomatic force. And the third point, and I think that's the most important one, is that the key role China played visualizes how regional actors actually view China, uh, which is a force beyond only economic um, partnership. And especially the fact that Saudi Arabia reached out to China, not the other way around, shows that China is no longer viewed as only an economic player, but also as a rising political and, and diplomatic force. Uh, so this paradigm shift that I mentioned is not necessarily something which is enforced from outside of the region, but also empowered or supported from within, which I think is, is, is very powerful and sends quite a clear message. Uh, and Hisham, you mentioned uh, regional agency. I really like that term because it sums up quite well the implication that China's growing uh, economic role has had for the region um, because of the possibility that was given to diversify external partnerships uh, or the portfolio of actors, reducing the unilateral dependency uh, of, of, of the US um, and and giving regional actors sort of a leverage to manage uh, relations and be more strategic uh, or balancing relations between the US and China. That being said, I think if we drill down a bit on what China actually did, I think it's really necessary to, to keep our feet on the ground. Um, 
in my opinion, there is a difference between mediation and facilitation. So yes, China facilitated the agreement. It provided the platform for the deal to, to be finalized. But there is a long history of actual mediation that took place in, in Iraq and Oman since early 2021. Adnan, you mentioned this in your, in your input. So the groundwork was laid long before March 2023. Um, and a lot of attention is, is given to China right now. And I, I see why that why that happens. It is a breakthrough, uh, but we shouldn't underestimate, you know, all the regional efforts that have led to that. For China, it was kind of a low hanging fruit. It was a low risk, high reward move to say, OK, we provide the platform mm -hmm. um, and then take the symbolic win. Um, and that also brings me a bit to to future outlook. I mean, China's le main leverage in the region is still economic. And it cannot underwrite that deal with any sort of security or military guarantee. So China's main strength remains its trade balance and the power that comes from it. So what we see right now is a roadmap to peace. Um, and it's a road that still has to be walked and that can be long and bumpy, I would say. Mm. And so far, it's not really clear how China will accompany Iran and Saudi Arabia in walking down that road. So facilitating the agreement China has veered into new territory. Uh, and that, of course, comes not without certain risks. So th the real test, if we think about China's role in the region, um, is now whether China will actually be able to enforce this diplomatic breakthrough with without ge getting bogged down in regional tensions. Um, and, and while the incentives China can give to both parties are pretty clear, it's mainly economic incentives, it remains unclear so far how China can guarantee the deal in case one party breaks the rules. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big question. A lot of people are, are having headaches. Um, 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 so, for example, the joint statement did not clarify how the sig signing parties or China will respond to violations. So I, I don't want to play the devil's advocate here, but I think this is a major breakthrough. But it's also the beginning and not necessarily the end of a very, very long process with a very uncertain Chinese role in it. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, Adnan, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the nature of relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, and your expectations for the future. Um, their recent history, of course, is littered with crises. There have been frictions. There's a fierce regional rivalry. Uh, given all that, how do you see the trajectory of the relations uh, going forward. Um, let me let me start by saying what an ideal scenario would look like. To me, uh, what Iran Saudi relations could ideally look like would be what we see today in Iran Turkey relations. There is a zillion reasons for Iran and Turkey to actually be imminently um, in political conflict. They have divergent interests in Syria in Iraq in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Uh, there was even at, at times Afghanistan as a new context in which Iranian and Turkish interests could uh, really go into opposite directions. But it seems as if these two countries are immune to actual conflict. And that the reason for that is obviously long uh, lasting and long standing trade relations. It's visa free travel between both countries. It's intermarriages. It's um, a high percent, I think, percentage of roughly 40% of Iran's population understand and speak Turkish. Um, and there is basically a huge um, people to people mobility between these two countries, while at the same time, regional rivalry, competition, and at times, yeah, in fact, um, dangerous. Uh, developments that could lead into enmity have been existent. So what I'm trying to say is that we cannot envisage Iran and Saudi Arabia to have a relations a relationship like Germany and France, for example. Um, but these two countries are destined to be competitors, to be rivals, but this rivalry and competition can be uh, something positive can in fact be something that drives both countries to strive for more. That sounds a bit romantic, but uh, let's look into the uh, into the future with with some with some potential hope. So how can we get there? And I think one point is that of course Iran is looking into Saudi Arabia as a country that can be an economic lifeline that can help um, improve Iran's 
potentially even oil experts. There have been some reports about this, that this was that this was part of the five rounds of dialogues held in Baghdad and Oman, but we don't really know for sure. So this is speculation. Um, but I think if in one way or another, the regional integration, the regional economic integration that Iran is after, that I outlined briefly, um, uh, is accomplished in relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and the potentials for that are there. Um, let's just think of the Saudi company that produces oil, cooking oil, Savola, which has basically taken over Iranian households uh, for, for many, many years. Um, things like this. If, if this were, if this was to continue, if economic integration between these two countries happen, I think this can lead to um, less confrontational rivalry. And let's just uh, um, mention that the context of Iraq, Syria, Lebanon will be essential, will be important to look at. The most difficult file will be the Yemen file, and there is a long path on that file to, uh, to walk. Um, but I also think in terms of Afghanistan and Pakistan, these two countries have a lot to discuss. Um, so there is a hell lot on their plates. Um, but I think in order for them to be less confrontational, uh, more people to people mobility is needed, economic integration. Um, and in fact, these two countries and populations really do not know each other. So that's that's an initial step that has to be taken. Back to you. Thank you, Adnan. Um, Hisham, a very similar uh, question. Um, one analyst has described the likely trajectory of relations between the two countries as a fragile, managed rivalry. Um, of course, Adnan uh, gave a little different uh, possibility talking about regional economic integration. How do you see uh, relations between these two countries um, developing? And what are the, the risks to the agreement? Uh, who are their potential spoilers? Okay. Safal is a good example, actually, uh, not to make any advertisements, but uh, it's, it's a good catch. Yeah. And it was operating during difficult times, even in Iran. So, uh, uh, but I believe in the, at the current moment, the deal is uh, purely tactical. It wouldn't produce radical outcomes or major policy shifts. The perceptions will probably remain the same for the short term. Uh, it will face also um, several serious challenges. Um, the road to success would not uh, be an easy ride, but I think that there is a great possibility to transform it into a strategic framework. Uh, and this will happen um, when both parties reach an uh, uh, equilibrium, a balance in their defense abilities meaning that Riyadh improves its missile defense and anti-drone capacity, and maybe also um, uh, nuclear technology, even if it was for civilian use. Um, and if the Saudis are serious in reconsidering their uh, nuclear posture, this will be a strategic reorientation. Many things will change with this, but I will leave, I'll, I'll leave this for a different debate, maybe. Another challenge um, is, the, as Adnan mentioned, the continuous competition between the Saudis and Iranians in places such as Yemen, Iraq, Lebanon, and, um, and even Syria now. Um, the Riyadh intervention is, is quite different. It would be merely a soft intervention. But Iran would see this as a threat to its extremely influential presence in these areas, or in these failed or semi-failed states, to be precise. On the spoilers point, if you allow me, um, I would I would add add the Sa I would add the Saudi relations with the U.S. as a possible spoiler. The U.S. is still the main weapon supplier for the Saudis, and it will remain so for the next decade or two. But at the same time, I'm, I'm not a diplomat, so I would also argue that it's the it's in the Saudi interest to maintain uh, international pressure on Iran until it goes back to the nuclear deal. This will also help the strengthening the current understanding between Riyadh and Tehran. So these things are could work against each other, but they also could produce um, a very positive results if, if coordinated very cautiously and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, in a very delicate manner. And I think that two countries are are capable in doing so at the current moment. Thank you, Hisham. Um, and uh, let me just follow up with. Um, a couple of the points that um, that uh, uh, Hisham was was making, um, he spoke about really some uh, asymmetries in 
um, security capabilities between the two countries, and that this uh, will, will need to be addressed uh, to create a stable relationship going forward. Um, is it is that your sense also, or and in I guess a broader uh, uh, perspective, how do you see relations between the two countries going forward? What problems do you see out there that might uh, jeopardize the the relationship? I um, I would assume that the 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 risks that exist. Um, one of the biggest risks to me is the agency that some of the non-state hybrid actor um, allies of Iran have developed over the year. I'm talking about groups in Iraq. I'm talking about um, particularly Ansar Allah in Yemen. Um, I'm talking about Hezbollah in Lebanon, of course. Um, we, and I think this was one of the major accomplishments of the talks between Iran and Saudi Arabia, that Iran on the one hand was willing to admit that it has a lot of leverage over these groups, mm -hmm. um, but the Saudi side was willing to acknowledge that Iran is not fully controlling them and that these actors do also have their own agendas, that they also have their own interests to a varying degree, that there are groups um, in Iraq that, like Qatayb Hezbollah, like um, Asaib Ahl al-Haq, who are actually having their own fights for dominance um, in, in Iraq, who may not necessarily like an Iranian-Saudi de-escalation in the region, which could come to the um, to the detriment of their relevance in the region. That is all speculation, but I'm just saying that the, the, the Iranian, um, let's say the broad network, the so-called axis of resistance, um, to me is, is not simply directed by Tehran, but can develop a life of its own. And should there be a development in the region, which might um, not be in the interest of a non-state actor, um, uh, but in the interest of Tehran, um, I don't know whether Iran will be effectively, effectively able to tame to tame actors from doing something. In a very specific example, if the Ansar Allah, if Ansar Allah in Yemen feels that it has to teach Saudi a lesson or the Emirates a lesson for something that is happening, um, I don't know whether Tehran could effectively stop Ansar Allah from doing so. So that is that is one concern. Um, the other concern is if Iran-US tensions um, escalate further or escalate to a degree which, um, in fact, makes any prospect for the revitalization of the nuclear talks. I'm not even speaking about the re revitalization of the JCPOA, but of the talks towards the JCPOA. If that fails, if tensions between the Iran and US flare up again, um, Iran's one of Iran's most effective tools was to exert pressure on US allies in the region. And what if we get back to the point where that is again on the agenda in Tehran? This is why I'm saying the benefits of outreach to Iran's regional rivals to its uh, to its south, being the UAE and uh, and Saudi. If that is developed quickly now, if the gains from that are tangible and viewed as a real strategic asset to Iran, that could, to some degree, um, lower the risk of the region becoming basically a theater for Iran-U.S. Uh, Iran uh, tensions. I'd leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Adnan. Um, Hasham, just a quick follow-up on this before we uh, move on to um, some discussion with uh, Julia about uh, China. Um, what about this issue? Um, that Adnan is talking about, about the agency of proxies. Um, what's your perspective on um, the uh, potential of uh, proxies for Iran? That's not the terminology exactly that um, mm -hmm. Adnan used, but it's, 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 it's my terms. What uh, potential do they have to um, sabotage this deal? Um, and how do you see the control element of these proxies um, from Iran's point of view? I think it's important to acknowledge first that, uh, yes, uh, Ansar Allah have some sort of agency. Uh, we keep seeing, the Saudis keep saying this all the time. This is not um, a new fact, but we think we also think that Admir al Houthi thinks that he's um, higher than, uh, and, um, and, um, 
uh, than uh, Khamenei, and uh, and uh, he thinks that he has a higher position compared to Khamenei. But this doesn't mean that uh, he's not part of uh, Iran forward defense uh, strategy in the region or axis of uh, resistance, as uh, Adnan calls it. Uh, this will probably not change in the foreseeable future, but we should expect that Iran um, uh, first place some pressure on the Houthis to de-escalate and engage in, uh, in talks in Yemen. Um, I do not think that anyone uh, would believe that Iran will drop the Houthis uh, because Tehran, uh, for obvious reasons, view Yemen as a strategic uh, uh, axis to uh, to uh, the Saudi inland uh, um, as a way to uh, influence Saudi and um, have some deterrence against the kingdom. Um, also, there is this perception that uh, that uh, Saudi may actually be a military threat to Iran. Uh, so we um, this has very uh, this is very impactful in the way that uh, reinforces its uh, bases and. Uh, uh, and it's foothold in these areas, especially in Yemen. So I'm, I'm not expecting any magical solutions, but um, I'm sure that Iran can influence the Houthis. And I am sure that this will happen in the next two months if, um, if things go, go as planned. Uh, and I think that they are capable with all the agencies, all the agency that the Houthi or other actors have, uh, but uh, we all know that these uh, uh, missiles that are fired and drones that are fired uh, uh, to, to Saudi are not made are not made in the caves of Saudi. They're made somewhere else. Mm. So I would expect a change in um, in this and um, in, the, in, um, in the short term we should see some changes, whether it's in Yemen or even in Lebanon or Syria. Thank you, Hisham. Um, I want to come back eventually to this issue of uh, of Yemen, but um, before we do that, I want to uh, bring Julia back into the discussion and talk a little bit more about the importance of China's involvement in this agreement. Um, Julia, a question for you. Is the agreement, uh, in your view, emblematic of Chinese, what some analysts call Chinese ascendancy in the Gulf? Um, what what is your take on that? And in what ways is China um, ascendant? How is it important um, to Saudi Arabia, for example, or to um, Iran? Um, give us a sense of the economic influence and uh, parameters beyond that. Yeah, thank you so much. I think the biggest the biggest uh, element is China's economic influence, which has grown steadily um, since yeah. The past two decades, and in particular since the implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, and for for China, um, the countries in the region are really important because of their favorable geographical location, proximity to the Red Sea, but also, and this is a very big factor, because of energy security and because of the oil and gas uh, exports. So China has become the most important trade partner for most countries from the region and also one of the biggest uh, export destinations for, for oil and gas. Um, and I think it is in particular China's economic growth, China's economic cloud that has led it to play the role it played in the facilitation of, of this deal. Um, because of what I said earlier about regional agency, through the, 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 the growing footprint of China, um, increasing investments, um, Countries from the region have have gotten a possibility to choose. Um, there is a there is a different actor with whom to do business. Uh, there is certainly an, a certain ideological affinity which makes it easier to do business uh, business with China than with the U.S. or with uh, countries from from Europe, for example. Um, and this has led to this regional agency that I that I mentioned before. Um, and although the groundwork for for this for this deal has been laid long before March 2023, what changed the equation towards the actual conclusion, uh, I think was in a sense the China factor because of the promise of Chinese investments uh, that has increased the potential to, to bolster the chances of actual implementation. For example, China offered Iran some incentives to come to the table 
without preconditions, including access to frozen funds in, in Chinese banks and promises to, to increase investments in the faltering Iranian economy and also to lend support in international negotiations over its nuclear activities. And China couldn't do that if it wasn't for its huge economic weight. Um, because the question that always comes up then is, okay, what are, what are the in incentives? What do we gain uh, from this? Um, so, so economy is a very, uh, very big factor here. That being said, it's very interesting to see how how China's role has been changing over the past years, um, because I would argue three or four years ago, it was mainly this economic partnership diplomacy that was driving China's approach to the Persian Gulf region. And that has changed. And the question that a lot of you know China watchers or China Gulf watchers have asked themselves is, how long can China hold up its mainly economical uh, on economical a political approach to the region without having to give some sort of you know political or diplomatic or security guarantee and i think that's what we are seeing right now um, the the depth and the extent of chinese investments in the region uh, has grown so much that china can no longer afford being uh, on the sideline and so it's gradually you know um, going to the center stage trying to to secure the environment for for own investments Mm, and I think the events Adnan mentioned uh, in the beginning in his input um, show quite clearly how how China can actually or what is at stake for China when regional turmoils escalate um, and when you know oil facilities in Saudi Arabia are being attacked uh, because that has an impact on Chinese uh, energy security. So I think now we are at the point where where China's approach. To the region is actually changing it is gradually changing and i wouldn't i wouldn't call this a game changer necessarily but it is a paradigm shift um and it's very interesting to observe into which direction that will go keeping in mind that that china on a global scale undergoes similar um developments so we've seen the the implementation of a global security initiative uh, that that xi jinping announced very recently um and in a sense, the, the felicitation of, of this agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia can be interpreted as a first attempt or as a as a blueprint or a launch pad for other diplomatic initiatives uh, that, that China will um will take. And I think it's not a coincidence that, that that this happened so shortly before Xi Jinping traveled to Moscow. Um so uh, we need to to read this and interpret this in a a global uh, context, I would say. Uh, Julie, just to follow up with you, uh, from from two angles, I want to follow up. One is this idea that um, China is um, broadening its its uh, relationship. This uh, huge economic clout is giving it new political and strategic possibilities. But you mentioned earlier that it also lacks in some ways the... Um, the security um, ability to to facilitate, for example, this agreement, and and I think more broadly, is there a risk that China can <clears throat> is going to overextend itself in in the region because of this um, disconnect between its huge economic clout and still relatively limited um, political and diplomatic uh, security um, aspects, however you want to put it, and then the the other angle I wanted to ask you is just what it, what do you see as China's um, perspective on the Gulf? How does it view the Gulf? Does it see it? Does it see itself as be, wanting to be a customer for everybody? Um, does it view the region as an economist would view the region, as some analysts uh, have, have have put it? What is China's perspective on the Gulf? If you could maybe take a crack um, at each of those points. Yeah, thank you so much. Maybe on your on your first question, um, yes, I see that risk. Um, but I mean, what China can always do is take a step back, um, mm -hmm. and it's not up to China to to make this agreement materialize. I, I wouldn't overestimate the importance of China uh, in in that regard. There are a lot of regional actors with a lot of capacities that can that can facilitate, um, um, you know, implementing. Um, the normalization. Um, 
and to pick up one question from the chat, if you may allow me, because it fits very well to, to your question. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked, did the Saudis and the Iranians really need China for this, or did China want a boost and the others were happy to give it one? Mm -hmm. I think that fits very well to your question. Um, because of what I said earlier about the, the important role of, of regional actors like Iran, like, like Oman, in actually mediating. Um, and what China has done is provide the platform. Mm -hmm. And that not necessarily means that China needs to be extremely active in making the deal uh, implement. Um, so China is very, very pragmatic. Um, and I think a lot of the, the future steps that we will see, um, or future actions of China in, in implementing the deal will depend on cost benefit calculations. And whenever the costs become too high, or whenever uh, China feels, okay, this is out of our control or this is beyond our experience, uh, I think they will take a step back um, and, and give more agency back to, you know, to regional actors. Mm -hmm. um, but I think having this, this neutral and economically extremely uh, important actor in the equation uh, will still be very, very important. Um, so that, that uh, on your first question, and maybe to add on that, as I said, it is in a sense a blueprint or a launch pad for for activities that uh, that might follow. Because in the past years, uh, mediation diplomacy has become one of the key pillars of China's foreign and security policy objectives and and practice. Mm, and it took the role as a facilitator in this agreement at a point when actually quite little risks were involved. Uh, and I think that that tells us a lot about how China is testing grounds uh, for potentially larger global. Um, endeavors. Mm. Thank you. Could you repeat your your second question? Yeah, I talked yes, so much about the give, first one now. Sure, Julie. If you could just give us a brief sense about how China views the region. Yeah, uh, I will do that. For for China, the region is um, is very important uh, because of several factors. The first is, as I said, the the geographical position and the role the region plays in China's Belt and Road Initiative. It is, in a sense, a gateway to Europe. Um, it has a very favorable uh, proximity to the Red Sea and to the very important sea lines of communication um, in the in the Red Sea, Strait of Hormuz, Bab al Mandeb Strait, Strait of Oman, um, all, all these all these yeah sea lines that are very very important for China's seaborne traffic. Um, mm -hmm. So the majority of, of trade um, from Europe, from the Middle East to Asia actually passes uh, through these straits. So that is important um, in terms of you know, ge geostrategic location. The second factor which makes the region very important for China diplomatically and also geopolitically is that it has become an arena that very interestingly visualizes the changing role of the US, much more so than in other world regions. And that, of course, is interesting to China in the context of larger systemic tensions and larger geopolitical uh, power, power plays, I would say. Um, and very often we hear that narrative that, that you know, the US leaves a vacuum in the Middle East and, and China is stepping in. Um, and that always strikes me because I, I really don't buy into that narrative, but mm -hmm. of course there is something to it. Um, so we, we tend to talk about the Chinese approach to the region as if it has actively challenged the US as a security actor and is now starting to somehow replace it. And, and that's of course not what's happening. China was pretty happy free riding on uh, under the US security umbrella for a very, very long time and expanding economic ties to all countries regardless of regional tensions. Mm. And the reason why China could do this was because of the US security umbrella. Um, and China has not actively challenged that even now uh, with with the, um, the, the diplomatic win, uh, which of course, in a sense, goes at the cost of, of the US, the win for Beijing, but a cost for Washington, um, was not actively sought. But of course, China benefits from, you know, the, the, the deteriorating U.S. role in the region, and also uh, that regional actors now prefer actually reaching out to China than to the U.S. for such diplomatic endeavor. Um, so it, the region is somehow a bit a testing ground also for for that. How far can we go in in uh, the context of systemic tensions with with the U.S.? Uh, I, I would argue. Yeah. 
Thank you, Julia. Um, Adnan, how do you think um, Iran looks at its relationship with China? Well, there are um, obviously there are some some um, some hopes. There are some maybe even illusions, but at the same time, it's it's a constant. Um, basically, it's a constant change between some utopian hopes and pragmatic, realistic expectations. So, on the one hand, Iran really thinks uh, it can, on the basis of its anti-imperialist raison d'être really seek to broaden its ties with, with China. It, this is not only um, a matter of trying to improve economic relations, that's the ultimate goal, but it's also um, goals in, in terms of uh, expanding people-to-people -people mobility um, to in fact allow more or to introduce the Iranian public more to China than before, because we all know that the Iranian public is um, not necessarily quite uh, very uh, uh, cynophile, uh, to quite to the to the opposite. I would even uh, say it's at times really xenophobic um, in the ways that that China is viewed in Iran. It may all have its reasons, um, but um, I think of course this is all about having a, um, in fact, economic lifeline to in position the the country in a on solid ground to have the emerging economic power power number one of the world um, on its side. But um, the key strategists of the country are, are aware that uh, as long as the U.S. sanctions regime exists on Iran, as long as these sanctions um, put Chinese economic interests in the U.S. at risk, um, relations between these two countries in economic terms will not flourish um, to the to the extent that Iran would hope uh, to see. But as a as a player that supports stability in Iran's immediate neighborhood, I think Iran doesn't mind to have um, Chinese as some sort of a security guarantor with all the limits that also Julia pointed to, um, but elevating this role of China in the region and by that, of course, also um, uh, sending some signals to Europe and the U.S. is part of, of Iran's outreach to Beijing on that. Back to you. Thank you, Adnan. Um, Hisham, I'll give you a chance also just to say a, a word, if you, if you wish, about um, Saudi Arabia's um, perspective on China, how important it views that relationship. Um, I have to say that for the Saudis and uh, uh in a single statement, the deal is certainly not a fundamental regional shift toward China. I think it's a, it's an ad adaptation to a multipolarity and uh, anticipated or, or the rise of China. Um, and I think uh, a very significant point and a distinction that I would make, I believe that the Chinese role means different things for different states in the region. It's not the same. So there is no single unified China role in the region. For instance, for the Iranians, it's important in pushing out America from the region. More China would mean less U.S. for Iran. And this is some, something that Iran wants. Uh, um, actually, we discuss uh, some of these points in details in a joint study or article uh, with an Iranian colleague that will be published in the coming few days in the Cairo Review. I encourage everyone to read it. Um, for the Saudis, China is important, but not for the same reasons. China is important because of the leverage it has on Iran. China is a, as a guarantor, a notarizer of the deal, which is very significant, I think, and crucial for the success of this deal and makes this deal qualitatively different from any understanding we had in the past between the two, the Saudis and Iranians. And from the Chinese side, I would say that uh, China is the biggest trading partners, uh, partner with all um, countries in the Middle East. It's, um, it also depends to a large ex extent on importing oil from, uh, from the Gulf. Uh, therefore, China has vital interests in the region's security and stability. Um, with no major military presence in the region, as Julia said, China was a free rider on the US military umbrella. So I would expect that China in the near future will use its political and economic cap capital as a vehicle to reinforce its presence in the region. Uh, we could, um, I mean, the China, the China role in the region would be quite different 
10 years from now. This is what I expect. Thank you, Hisham. Uh, Julia, let's transition. Um, I'll let you take the lead on this uh, next uh, question. Uh, talk a little bit about um, you, a U.S. perspective on, on what has happened. Um, there's been a lot of um, analysis about it, but what what is your sense of this um, overall observation that Chinese involvement here in this deal is emblematic of the decline of, of U.S. influence in the Gulf? Is that uh, an accurate or partially accurate observation, or do you see this deal as just um, emblematic, basically, of, um, as Hisham says, um, a, a region and countries in the region um, seeking to diversify strategically um, in a multipolar uh, world? I think it's both. Um, I think it is the diversification um, in, yeah, in the context of multipolarity. But I also see a not necessarily a decline um, in the role of the US, but a decline of trust in the US. Um, and I think that is especially where China comes into play and where China is also very active in trying to paint a picture of being a responsible and a reliable partner, one that that um, holds up its promises. And I think that's that's um, that exactly what what's happening right now. So it's it's both. Uh, it's the the multipolarity factor, but it's also the declining uh, trust in the U.S. as a partner. Yeah. Got it. Um, what about that, um, Hisham? Um, do you see a decline yourself in American uh, influence in the uh, Gulf? Um, or is, do, how do you see um, Gulf countries building their relations with uh, China? Are they attempting to strengthen their hand in dealing with the Americans um, to try to, as one uh, article put it recently, to try to get better concessions from the U.S.? Um, how would you describe that? dynamic um in any way you look at it i think china's role in the agreement undermines the role of the us in the region however i would um, differ from those that exaggerate the degree of this undermining uh, for the simple reason that china cannot replace the us anytime soon specifically the security role <clears throat> Uh, as you alluded to, the U.S. security role in the region is unique. No major power has a significant military presence in the region other than the U.S., and this will be the case for many years to come. China nor any other state can compensate what America is doing or can do for the GCC or the kingdom, uh, but this does not mean having all the eggs in the American basket. Uh, in my view, this would be... Uh, a cardinal mistake and a, and a fatal strategic miscalculation um, by these states, the Gulf states. Uh, we have new partners in town. This is a new variable. All states in the region needs to deal with this fact. And for America, China is a rival, but for others, no exceptions, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Beijing, um, even the Israelis, Beijing is a partner and a customer. In the last 10 years, the main source of the kingdom's uh, income came from Asia, from China, from Japan, from India, from South Korea. The sim this simple fact, I think, has um, great consequences um, on Saudi foreign policy. Uh, one, Riyadh cannot uh, no longer uh, rely on the U.S. alone. It needs arms from other exporters. And it needs also to localize its military industry, especially in air defense. And of course, this will not happen overnight. But this means having strategic partnerships with other powers, such as China, France, the UK, and even Russia, because um, apparently the Cold War has ended a long time for the Saudis. Two taking sides in great power conflicts uh, is not something affordable to the Saudis. I think I do not think it's uh, even a matter of choice. I mean, putting it mildly, doing so would be self-destructive and could fire back badly, especially with this American disengagement from the region. <clears throat> Three, stability, um, security are the main drivers for, for uh, or ingredients, if I may say so, of Saudi foreign policy in the Gulf and the broader mean also. This will include Yemen, Iran, and many other places. Um, but at the same time, I also think that the region, the Gulf specifically, 
benefits greatly uh, keeping the Americans and inter- يعني the American international pressure on Iran which will help in making Iran live to the deal with the Saudis or any other regional deal for that matter. There is a Saudi interest in keeping this uh, continuing. But I do expect something, do I expect something more than that? يعني for instance, uh, maybe a regional security initiative supported by the US. And the answer is uh, no. Hmm. Uh, does anyone remember Mesa, the so-called Middle East Strategic Alliance? The Arab Alliance, there was no common enemy, different political systems, very different economies. It wasn't a feasible goal. Uh, but the important question remains, how, w- how would the Saudis keep the U.S. on board while opening to Iran? I think um, there is no clear answers to these questions um, now, but I think this will be clarified in the coming few months, not far away. Very interesting insight. Um, I think for now, you're, you're, um, I would say the, the, the overall situation is fortunate so far that uh, the American perspective on it seems to be relatively subdued and positive, um, at least publicly. They've, they've expressed um, support for the um, agreement. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that uh, evolves over, over time. Um, and then I have a, a question with a uh, desire for a short answer uh, in a little different direction. Where do you see the interests of China and the US overlapping in the Gulf region or do they at all? I in fact have have no doubt that ultimately securing the the waters of the Strait of Hormuz um, is probably a shared goal in having um, you know, there is this Middle East fatigue, at least in the U.S. public discourse that I am following. So having all of that tuning down is certainly a shared interest. Let's at the same time not be naive about um, arms exports that need to continue into this region. And for that, you you couldn't have an, a pacified region. It cannot be a region without any conflict. So that would be a, a bit too naive to hope that that would be the case. But I think Tuning down the heat of the region is a shared interest of both China and the U.S. Thank you. And Anand, while I have you, um, let me ask you, we haven't talked about it much, but I'm interested in exploring with you um, the impact of Iran's nuclear program in shaping uh, this agreement between Saudi Arabia and um, and Iran. Uh, Expectations for the uh, agreement, uh, the trajectory relations might take. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? How you think what what you see is the connections or the indirect connections, or or um, as you how ha- however you see the issue? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> I would really uh, stress that in Iran's security and strategic calculus, these two domains, regional policies and the nuclear file, have really been separate with separate goals. Um, Upping the the leverage on the nuclear file has never been meant to be a security threat to Iran's neighboring countries. And if I, um, while listening to regional um, interlocutors from Iran's neighboring countries, the nuclear file has never been such a point of concern. Um, For the Saudis, of course, the, the nuclear safety has been important in terms of should something happen to nuclear plants which are not too far away from Saudi territory, that is a point of concern. But Iran's immediate neighbors have never been concerned about an Iranian nuclear weapon, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, That is a much bigger point of concern for Israel, obviously. So the nuclear file as a potential domain on which Iran could escalate its deterrence policies has never been something vis-a-vis its neighbors. So normalizing or rapprochement with the neighbors does not mean uh, that Iran is also more willing to to minimize the threat posed by its nuclear uh, um, uh, dossier, by its nuclear profile. That is something vis-a-vis Europe and the US um, and will continue as long as Iran believes that through that file, some sort of um, arrangements can be found with, with Europe and the US. I think that a Saudi-Iranian rapprochement can open ways to discuss nuclear safety, and I think that is really something important. 
I also think that the opposition from GCC states towards the JCPOA will from now on be nearly zero. It had already tuned down. My, my uh, impression was that for Saudi Arabia and the UAE, it was much, much more important to simply know where the JCPOA is heading. It was not so important whether it is going to be reinstalled or not, but rather um, uh, what the state of play actually is. So um, I think for Iran, there can be a win that Abu Dhabi and Riyadh and also uh, Manama uh, will no longer oppose the U.S. taking that file further. So here I would see a potential positive impact on, on the JCPOA file, but that's all that I would see. Other than that, I actually view these domains as being um, separate and not necessarily directly impacting uh, each other. The one thing I would add is uh, the main main criticism we have always heard about the JCPOA was that it never addressed regional issues. Um, while footnote, I would add, it never was designed to do that, but it was a major criticism. So now we are basically seeing the regional talks happening in regional formats. And there was a question in the chat that I thought was important. Why was Iraq, Iraq never given credit for the role it played? And I would really say that this credit was not given in Europe and the U.S., um, but in the region, Iraq has perceived this credit, and also in this um, declaration in uh, in on March 10th, um, the three parties bas basically alluded to Iraq's um, acknowledgement in this respect. So the regional talks are happening. Maybe that can facilitate the process in the nuclear talks. Thank you, Anand. Um, Hisham, any perspective from from your angle on the Iran uh, nuclear program and um, the status of uh, the negotiations over the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, um, just in general, how it might shape this um, restoration of diplomatic relations? I, um, I've i noticed that we did not hear any official statements from both parties on this. I don't think that it was even discussed, mm. uh, but this is my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the picture is very complex. Uh, it depends also on the Saudi response, uh, the way that the Saudi, uh, 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 let's say the U.S.-Iran talks um, won't advance, what would happen? Would the Saudis uh, pursue a nuclear weapon? Um, this is a complete strategic re reorientation, as I said earlier. Uh, it will have uh, uh, several and important implications on uh, both on the kingdom and uh, also on the region. Um, I'm not seeing I'm not seeing this on the table and um, the, and the immediate discussions between the two states. Other uh, issues that were not included in the original deal would be probably there, as Adna mentioned, the, the regional activities of Iran and the missile and drones program of Iran. But this, um, I would, I would assume that the nuclear uh, deal, depending on what happens later on in Vienna, uh, it will come into the picture and it will be part of uh, the discussion because there are major, as Adnan also mentioned, safety issues, especially for the smaller Gulf states also uh, closer to Iran. If anything happens in Iran, what could be uh, the consequences? Um, and I think. Um, but 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 the nuclear deal wasn't something that um, that made this deal to happen. Uh, and again, here we need to acknowledge what Mustafa al Kadhimi and the Iraqis did. I think it's, it should be uh, uh, celebrated and it should be praised. And we spoke about this several times mm -hmm. um, um, and on several uh, 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 previous sessions. But I think the the the. If, if the nuclear deal wasn't in the table. So what I think that the, the most important question to answer, why did the deal happen now? Uh, why not wait uh, until an international settlement happened? Uh, a deal in, in Vienna, a deal that uh, would also uh, include the Americans and Europeans, um, especially that Iran now is in its, uh, as they say, back foot. Uh, faced with serious dissent and, uh, and serious protests. And also add to this the failure of the so-called uh, resistance economy. So why now? Um, um, I think states in the region, uh, especially the Saudis, have learned from uh, previous lessons. 
In 2015, uh, the Saudis uh, uh, told the Americans and the Europeans that they want their issues to be on the table. Mm. Uh, and we, uh, they also told them that they, we want to be present on the table when negotiating with Iran. Uh, none of these requests uh, 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 happened. They were all denied. Uh, we have also, uh, of course, the U.S. disengagement from many parts of the Arabian Peninsula, which has contributed also to the rapidly changing strategic calculations of the Saudis, combined with the failure of the maximum pressure. Uh, and uh, and I don't think I'm simplifying the issue by saying that the Americans is withdrawing from the region, China will replace it, is, is very superficial. No, no one is saying this. It's not accurate, and, um, and, and it's, not, it's not part of the Saudi calculation. But uh, the fact that America is withdrawing some of its installations in the region have contributed definitely to the Saudi decision. Plus, you have the Israeli threat. This is the elephant in the room to bomb Iran nuclear infrastructure, which makes the region on um, high alert, to say the least. Uh, it's clear that the Saudis uh, want to stay away from such a an impossible uh, disastrous escalation. They do not want to be part of it by any means. And I think this is a very wise and reasonable uh, path to take. If you allow me to add uh, just a Please. simple point. I think also Iran, from its side, it, it, the Iranians know that their edge and advantage of low-cost uh, drones and missiles will end soon. Uh, it's, it will not be there for a long time. Iran is watching closely that the Saudis is catching up in both drones and also anti-drone mi and missile defense. So it seems um, as a perfect moment for all sides to start a serious normalization process. That's why I think that this time could be very different than the ones, Ambassador, you mentioned at the beginning of this panel. This could be um, a really game changer, and we could see a very different Saudi-Iranian relations in the near, not far future. Thank you, Hisham. Let me uh, bring in at this point um, some questions from our um, audience. We've got a lot of uh, very interesting questions. Um, let me start with one from... Um, um, Greg Gauss, um, who is a professor, obviously, but also uh, one of our uh, board members for um, AGSIW. And um, here is his question. I think I'll direct it initially towards um, Adnan. Uh, the Iraq channel had gone cold in mid-2020 or so. What changed to renew the dialogue uh, between Saudi Arabia and in Iran, basically. One thing was Chinese willingness to become involved. The other was the uprising in Iran. How important is each of those factors relatively in explaining the new momentum? Yeah, thanks for this, obviously, um, important questions. I leave the, the China bit to, to, to Julia, maybe. Um, um, so I, I think, of course, the Iranian government in particular um, needed some sort of foreign policy success. Uh, obviously, this agreement is nothing that can create a jubilant atmosphere at home. So I think the broader Iranian public doesn't really care about, about this rapprochement. It should in one way or another, but it, since it really doesn't have any immediate implications on Iran's economic situation, which is uh, a key um, uh, issue and a key reason for the hardship of Iran's population, nor does it have an impact on the situation of civil rights, of course. This is completely detached from it. So this is no political success story that Iran can sell at home as a big, as a big thing. And yet there has been, of course, um, positive uh, reactions to it. But let, let me get back to my uh, to my earlier uh, point about the Supreme National Security Council being in the lead. This is not the government of Ibrahim Raisi who can take credit for what has been accomplished, but this is the Supreme National Security Council, which is, as I mentioned earlier, cross-factional, cross-institutional. Now, of course, the, the foreign minister, uh, the current sitting foreign minister as part of the current government can take over. And maybe if he is able with his Saudi counterpart to turn this into something tangible, to turn this into something that has a trickle down effect on the Iranian public, then it can be something which 
is really also welcomed by Iran's population. So I would, if this was the JCPOA we're talking about, then of course we could say the Iranian protests of last fall have led to the, a sense of urgency that we need to move on on this file. But with this particular agreement, I think it may have played a role in terms of let's have some sort of foreign policy success, but it's nothing that I would rate uh, too high. And with with regards to China, the, all, the thing that I can say from an Iranian perspective is that um, it, it came as a surprise to, to many also inside Iran that China has played that role um, and that the, the, the Xi Jinping's visit to, to, to Saudi in December, uh, Ibrahim Raisi's visit to Beijing in January, February, I'm not sure exactly when it was, I think February, was not seen as something significant in terms of regional policy. So that came as a, as a surprise in the end. Thank you, Adnan. Um, Julia, um, I'm going to give you a chance to uh, also take a, a crack at that uh, question, but I want to expand it a little bit and add a couple of other questions that audience members have asked that relate to China. Um, one uh, is as follows. Did the Saudis and the Iranians really need China for this agreement, or did uh, China need a regional boost and the Iranians and the Saudis um, comply basically and uh, agree to let China have a win is essentially the question. The other question is, what about the importance of the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization for Saudi Arabia and Iran? Um, can this have a significant uh, influence in the future? Thank you very much. I will start with your first question. Um, and I would emphasize what, what Adnan has said before. Uh, I wouldn't overestimate mm, the Chinese willingness to, to actually facilitate this deal. I think what is what has been more important were the regional uh, dialogues that have uh, that, that have led uh, to this. Um, China did not reach out to Iran and Saudi Arabia to, to uh, close this deal. So Raisi visited China in February. Uh, in March, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia reached out to China to provide the platform for this deal. So in the end, yes, maybe the willingness of the Chinese to, to provide this platform made the difference. Um, but I think what, what was much more important was uh, what happened in the run-up uh, to, um, to, to this deal. Mm, to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, I wouldn't... I mean, we can read this in the context of uh, the Iran-Saudi uh, normalization agreement um, and, and, and in the context of China's role, but I wouldn't interpret uh, too much into that, um, into that correlation. Uh, I, I don't think that um, uh, Saudi Arabia joining came as a surprise. Um, I mean, Iran joined in 2022 as a full member, so I think it was only a matter of time until Saudi Arabia would join as well. Um, and I think Already in 2021, uh, there has been what Saudi Arabia signaled the willingness to become a dialogue uh, partner in or a dialogue member in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, and in 2022, also Qatar was given dialogue uh, partnership status, uh, for example. Um, I also wouldn't overestimate the power of the SCO. It is a club of like-minded countries, but mm -hmm. still with extremely diverging geostrategic and geopolitical interests. So it is rather a forum for ideas exchange than, than an, an actual actor. But of course, it could provide a platform for Iran, Saudi Arabia, and China to exchange ideas um, where where China already has a very a very strong role, um, but yeah, we we need to see if it will be that arena for for talks in the future. Thank you, Julia. Um, I have a question from the audience that I'll give to as a toss up to either Adnan or Hisham, either of you that would like to answer it. it they're asking about the implications of this uh, agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia for the UAE and for Israel. In which, in which sense, uh, meaning that this could, um, um, if an escalation, say an escalation happens in the region, that this would, um, uh, that's, that this would affect um, the deal between the Saudis and Iranians? I, um, I don't think so. Uh, I think that this is, um, uh, 
that this is um, this diplomatic engagement between the two would continue. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would complement uh, 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 the deterrence that the Saudis are, are trying to do uh, vis-a-vis Iran. Um, and I think that uh, uh, I think that the UAE would also benefit from such a deal. We're seeing also similar talks. So um, you know, the Saudis, I would separate. The, I wouldn't put the Emiratis and the Israelis in the same basket. I don't think that this is accurate. Um, the the Gulf, uh, obviously, the Saudis are the door of the Gulf, and I think other Gulf states, if this is successful, mm-hmm. it will open the doors for the Gulf and the Gulf economies for the Iranians. So the Iranians have a very and you know, um, um, a large and you know, a vested interest in maintaining the deal, other than the China guarantee. Um, and if you allow me to say also that. Um, I think all states in the region are going to what I call a, um, a self-discovery mode, um, trying to find uh, a new equation between uh, um, internal uh, demands and legitimacy and also their foreign policy. Mm. So the Israeli factor would not uh, influence this process because it's, the region is very, very complicated. There is no magical solutions. Uh, there are no one-size-fits-all for the problems of the region. We need a generic and a specific process or processes for all neighboring states, whether it's Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, or even Yemen. Uh, if we want to move forward and have some sort of uh, stability with our, within our borders, um, it's a very, in a, in a very difficult region. Uh, and I'm not talking about a unified security, arch- security architecture in the region, as I said, I think that this is a fantasy. It's a myth. It doesn't exist. And I, uh, I think we should, we should engage uh, global and regional sharks, and demand more from uh, from them, including. And I would put our American friends on the top of the list. It's not only the Chinese. Uh, Americans, the Europeans, should contribute. Uh, I think in maintaining such a deal, and also pressuring Iran and. Uh, and uh, trying to make Iran abide with this deal and other deals in the region. I think we are in a, the region is opening uh, to, uh, to, to a very good opportunity of stability, and no, and no one wants to see any escalation in the region, whether it comes from the Israelis or any other place. I Thank leave you, it to um, and then, uh, Another question from our audience is about um, Russia and the role or lack of a role of Russia in this particular instance. Um, essentially, the uh, audience member is asking, is it is the fact that China took the lead on this and not Russia uh, emblematic of Moscow's diminishing influence in the Gulf? Um, yeah, well, another field where, where I don't, you know, I haven't looked into this that much, but I would uh, I would assume that, I mean, in Iran, you can clearly see and sense in in conversations with interlocutors there that uh, Russia is obviously seen as as being um, taken up in all its capacities elsewhere so there is no way that Iran could could um, sense or any country in the region for that matter that that Russia could now have the capability of of spending a lot of political weight into uh, regional security regional dialogue regional arrangements um, in the in the in Iran and Saudi Arabia's neighboring region, so that would be uh, too too big of a too too big of of a task to lift for for Russia. So um, I think it it makes perfect sense to see um, Iran and Saudi Arabia ascribing this role to to China. Whether or not that leads to further deepening of ties with Russia is the big question. We know that that Iran's um, trade of weapons with with Russia has uh, has really gone up. Um, and um, obviously, that can continue much uh, in much smoother way uh, when China is the security guarantor of the deal that we are talking about, compared to if Europe was that guarantor or, or the US, of course. So um, in a nutshell, I would really say that the Iran's view of Russia right now is not of a country that could be uh, capable of, um, of of playing the role that China currently uh, is playing, um, and that's why that's why Beijing was the was was the choice. 
I, I, I want to follow up uh, quickly with one final uh, comment from our audience. And then I'm going to ask uh, panelists if they would um, maybe bring this to a close with a, a very brief um, summary observation of a minute or so. Um, we have a question from Hussein Ibish, who's one of our um, resident scholars at uh, HSIW and a, a brilliant uh, fellow. Um, he's asking about the um, really what would be the impact uh, or, or or is the impact, the, the critical impact, really whether there's going to be a thaw in uh, U.S.-Iranian relations? And, and it, isn't that really the game changer? And if that doesn't happen, um, that the current deal is, is is in some ways restricted as to how far it will be able to develop. Just based on realities, I think he's talking about strategic realities. I've summarized yes. this question, but uh, because of time. Sure. No, thanks for that. And um, hi, dear Hussein. Great to know that you're listening to us. Um, I would say, look, what is really important is that, and this is too long to dive into, but just to mention that in my in my sense, in my assessment from 2017, 18 onwards, Iran finally took Riyadh seriously as a political actor in its own right and no longer just saw Saudi Arabia through the lens of U.S. policies. So I think Iran today um, is looking differently at Saudi Arabia compared to seven, eight um, years ago. This has really changed um, um, it also vis-a-vis -vis the United Arab Emirates. Why am I mentioning this? To me, this really matters in its own Iranian-Saudi relations um, dynamics, so that that has really its very own dynamics now, which, which may, in fact, to some extent, also be detached from, from the bigger picture of U.S.-Iran tensions. Having said that, as I discussed earlier, if we want to see deeper economic integration between Iran and Saudi Arabia, of course, it would facilitate this and boost this if U.S. sanctions were partly to be lifted or to be lifted to a large part, which would, of course, make life much easier for Saudi Arabia um, to, to, trade with, to, to, to conduct trade with Iran. So, of course, for this to be even bigger uh, in its importance, um, improved Iran-U.S. relations would matter, but I would not play down the significance of this as a regional rapprochement um, uh, only because Iran-U.S. are still at, um, in shambles over other issues. Thank you, Adnan. That's a good, uh, a good uh, tackling of that uh, challenging question. Uh, can I ask a panelist, if you would, to give a brief um, summary if, you, if you'd like, of a minute or so uh, as we round out the discussion today. Uh, Julie, would you like to start? Yes, I, I can start. Um, and again, I would, I would like to emphasize what Adnan has just mentioned. I think it's a major regional um, success that, that we are seeing here, the regional rapprochement and uh, the, the regional agency which has developed over the past years. Uh, so, so to go back to the question a bit, of course, we can say we overestimate all of these factors uh, and, and the role of external actors. But it's very difficult to say what in what in the end made the difference, right? I mean, it's it's a process that that has been long in the making. Uh, mediation talks have been going on, uh, going back and forth. Now China has come in to provide the platform. And in the end, it's all of these these different um, elements that, you know, make the whole puzzle. So it's very difficult to say this was the game changer or this was the turning point. Um, so coming back to what I said in my initial statement, it is a roadmap to peace. Um, and I think it's very interesting to see how things will play out. Um, it is a major breakthrough. It is the beginning of a very, very long process. It's not the end. And I think a lot will happen happen uh, yeah, during that process. Um, and it will be very interesting to observe how China will you know, accompany Iran and Saudi Arabia on that roadmap uh, to peace. Uh, and maybe if we have a, a webinar in one year or two years, we will talk differently about the role of China and how it has, you know, replaced or not replaced uh, the U.S. Uh, in the region. Uh, but for now, I think a lot remains to be seen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Hisham? It's already 6.30 here, so I would like to invite everybody for breakfast, but maybe hopefully soon, inshallah. Riyadh. Uh, just a quick comment on the um, sanctions. I think even with the sanctions in Iran, economic 
integration in areas such as uh, maritime security, climate change, renewable energy, and of course, energy policies uh, is very possible. Uh, they can work together until uh, some sort of an opening happened. And uh, But I wanted also to say that this deal is a result of uh, a mainly dialogue. Uh, and I think the two sides need to continue dialogue on their threat perception and also on uh, and we need to see results. We need to see the Iranian uh, the, um, the Iranians uh, uh, um, reducing their support, if I may say, to the Houthis, and also from the other side. Uh, from the other side, the Iranians are a little bit upset from what they see as a uh, as Saudi support for uh, 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 campaigns, informational campaigns against them. Maybe we'd see it toning down there, but. Well, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, this is open, and I would expect that we would see these changes and um, uh, soon, sooner than later. I'll, I'll leave it there, and uh, hopefully we can conduct another session later after Ramadan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hisham. Um, Adnan? Basically, two points. Uh, the one thing that makes me hopeful about this is that both Iran and Saudi Arabia, for varying reasons, are... Uh, fundamentally building this on the fundament of economic considerations. On the Iranian side, it's about economic lifelines in times of sanctions, exploring new trade avenues in its immediate neighborhood. So that is about economic um, relations to the neighboring countries, out of which Saudi Arabia is hugely important. On the Saudi side, we heard Hasham speak about um, the, the, the transformations um, of, of various forms that need a stable region. So it's all based on an economically driven logic, which makes me hopeful because that is more of a cost benefit analysis uh, um, uh, that, 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 can all, that can lead to, to more tangible steps. The second thing I would want to say is um, we are in an era in which the value of dialogue is put in question. Um, I don't know that much about the US discourse, but in, in Europe, that certainly is a case. Uh, that the value of dialogue is put in question as being just something that leads to appeasement. Um, it certainly doesn't. Um, and dialogue means reconciliation. It doesn't necessarily mean recognition, but it means or legitimi legitimizing the other. But it basically means um, legitimizing some of the talking points, concerns and interests. And that is ultimately reconciliation. And that lead can lead to something that we just saw. So we if we uh, in Europe and in the US look into the region where we see so much conflict should really be um, yeah, so uh, welcoming this much, much more than we already do in spite of all the skepticism. Thank you, Adnan. And thank you to all the panelists. This has been a really interesting um, discussion. You've handled the questions with a lot of uh, intellectual um, depth and dexterity, and I appreciate uh, all of you for participating. I also want to thank our uh, audience members for uh, actively engaging. We had a very busy uh, Q&A function throughout the discussion, so I think there was a lot of interest. Um, and thanks to everyone. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you again at our next uh, AGSIW event. Thank you very much.